Today on Applied Science, I'd like to show you this physics demo. It's an acoustic radiometer, and much like a Crookes radiometer, it has veins that are absorptive on one side and reflective on the other. But unlike a Crookes radiometer, this is powered by sound waves, not light waves. So inside this sealed chamber here, we're going to pump a ton of sound, over 130 decibels. And the difference between the sound pressure on one side of those veins versus the other is going to cause it to turn around. So in today's video, I'm going to show you how I built this. We're going to try different gases and different pressures. And uh, just like a Crookes radiometer, there's actually more going on here than you might think. By changing the way I'm going to put sound into the chamber, I can actually make the rotor spin the wrong way. So there's multiple effects driving it. Um, in the service of putting all this together, I also came up with a way to monitor the health of the speakers remotely, because I actually blew up a lot of speakers getting here. Um, so place your bets now to think of whether hydrogen or sulfur hexafluoride is going to make the rotor spin faster or slower. Despite this being a really great physics demo, and also fairly straightforward to put together, I've never seen one of these acoustic radiometers in a science museum or even discussed anywhere on the internet until recently. It was actually a YouTube video suggestion, one of those diamonds in the rough, from someone named Dan Russell, a physics professor at Penn State who has a lot of other great acoustics videos. He found a videotape from the 90s of this acoustic radiometer in action, and I tracked down the original paper that described the construction of this. So other than that one paper and that one video from the 90s, I've never seen this anywhere else. If you have, I'd like to, I'd like to know, so please put that in the comments. I just want to show you how good the sound insulation of this chamber is. You can probably hear this in the background, but what I'm going to do is lean in and lift the lid so that you can hear how loud it really is inside there. Yeah, it's, um, I, I actually, I don't know what that sounds like in your headphones, but um, it's pretty ear piercing here. It's, it's definitely to the point of being painful. When I started this experiment, I knew that I wanted to test different pressures and gas compositions, and so I started with a chamber that I knew could hold vacuum. Uh, luckily, I already had this chamber with the thick glass plates on the top and the bottom, so we can see what's going on in there. And because of this, I did four veins instead of two, because the vein size couldn't be quite as large as in the original paper. And these veins are made with laser-cut one millimeter thick aluminum, and then I just bought a generic sound absorbing foam from Amazon. I'm not even exactly sure what it is. It's just sort of a pressed fibrous material, about 10 millimeters thick, or maybe a little bit more. And I cut that out with the laser as well, and made two sets of veins, left-handed and right-handed, so that we could switch them and confirm that the rotor actually changes direction. This is a really good experimental technique. Keep everything the same, same speaker placement, same sound, same chamber, same everything. Just take the hub out, swap the veins and expect to see the opposite rotation. This sort of proves, or it's very, very strong evidence, that the effect we're seeing is really caused by the difference between the absorptive and the reflective side. And you might say, well, yeah, but what else could it be? Well, there's actually a lot of other things it could be. Phenomenon where a vibrating speaker, like for example, in those little water misters, it's just a piezoelectric buzzer in there, basically in the megahertz range, actually shoots quite a bit of water out the surface. How could it do this if it's just vibrating back and forth? So this idea of acoustic streaming could actually explain the rotation, but it would be the same if they're for left-handed and right-handed um, rotor veins. So we'll get into this more in just a minute. A couple more construction details. Initially, I had a 3D printed hub and I used a sewing needle that just bore down onto a countersunk hole that I drilled into a steel rod to support this thing. And that worked okay but I was running into problems with it having like a preference for rotation. Like I could see it was getting stuck in a rut. To have really smooth, perfect measurement of the forces on this rotor, it would need to be a higher quality bearing. And so I took apart an analog voltmeter and took out the jeweled bearings that this thing uses. It's basically a cone-shaped piece of um, sapphire, or rather it has a cone um, polished into it. And then there's a matching metal spike that fits in there that's also polished. And so when this thing is put together, the friction is super low and it has no preference to find one spot, like one rotation. And since the rotor itself is made out of non-magnetic materials, there really isn't any other forces um, that are gonna push this thing around. Of course, I used little lead weights to balance the thing just so that there was no preference that way, one way or another. And I confirmed to myself that it would stop at almost any position. It really had no preference to find one rotation or one orientation. 
While I was still figuring out the problems with the pivot and my sound source, I had this issue of blowing up too many speakers. You know, it's one of those things where you're kind of cranking it up, and at the time I wasn't getting very good rotation, so I'd be turning the thing up and it was starting to spin, and then just turn it up a little bit louder, and then, you know, oh, there goes another pair. And so I needed a better way to measure how close to failure we were. And the manufacturer's uh, ratings do not help at all. So if you buy a tweeter that is rated 100 watts, that does not mean that you can put 100 watts into that tweeter. What it means is if you build a speaker out of it with a woofer and a tweeter, and you have a crossover in there, you can put 100 watts into that whole speaker system, and the crossover will actually only pass a small amount of that 100 watts into the tweeter. So from an engineering perspective, this seems like cheating, but you know, from a stereo system builder's perspective, it makes the most sense because it's the only thing you can really um, measure other than getting out your oscilloscope, which is what we're doing here. So what we've got here is um, a desktop class D amplifier here, and on one channel I've got a 0.1 ohm resistor, and I'm using one channel of the oscilloscope to measure the voltage across that resistor, essentially measuring the current, and then the other channel measures the voltage across the entire pair there. So this will allow us to measure the current very accurately, or measure the power very accurately, but that doesn't help if we still don't know what the speaker's real limit is. So what we could do is just turn it up until the speaker fails and then just never go above that power limit. But at this point, I had already blown up so many speakers, I didn't really want to do that again, and came up with a better idea. Instead, I took apart a speaker, got the voice coil out, and looked at it with an infrared camera, and then passed some current into there. And then what we can do is turn up the power and measure how the um, temperature changes. Of course, it goes up when we put more power into it. But something else interesting happens. The impedance goes up. Remember, the voice coil is just a coil of copper wire. And so when it gets hot, its resistance changes. And we can measure this completely passively just because we're measuring the current and voltage uh, that's coming out of the amplifier. So we can make a little chart of how temperature correlates with impedance then put the speaker back together and use the same uh, script, the same little Python script that just does the RMS voltage divide by RMS current and uh, figure out what the temperature of the coil is. So this is great because now we have a real actual measurement of how the voice coil is doing. It takes into account uh, cooling into the pole piece and sort of even the history of the thing. So if you dump a lot of power in for a long time, it's gonna build up heat and you wanna compensate for that. So after doing this, I didn't blow up any more speakers, so that's, that's great. Initially, I used a Tektronix signal generator to create white noise, broadband white noise, and I thought I would filter it with this fancy Stanford Research Systems um, low and high pass filter. Uh, this did not work at all. This caused a huge number of problems that were hard to diagnose. I have a feeling because there was so much out of band noise. Um, if you ask for white noise from a, you know, an arbitrary function generator, it produces everything, megahertz, you know, very broadband noise. And I think it either just uh, saturated the filter and somehow got into the amplifier and just caused a huge number of problems. Basically, it was trying to amplify things that were not going to be in the audible range, even though this is a very high gain, uh, high, you know, quality filter. So anyway, so I eventually switched to just using the laptop as the source of the sound. And you can go to these websites that generate white noise if you want, or pure tones if you want. And we just pass that in again into here so that I can shape the white noise. 3 to 11 kilohertz is great because between 3 and 11 kilohertz, this particular speaker is most sensitive. So by going in here, we get the most bang for our buck in terms of the power going into the speaker. So speaking of different sounds, uh, how did I make the rotor spin the wrong way? Well, first, what I call the right way is how um, sound pressure would work from sort of a kinetic standpoint where on the absorptive side, if, if something is coming in and stops, basically it gets absorbed into the rotor, you get one unit of momentum transfer. But on the reflective side of the rotor, this thing comes in and bounces off, actually delivering twice the amount of momentum. That's what I'm calling the right way. And to get that to work, we use white noise. Uh, the reason for that is that there shouldn't be any standing waves in that chamber because the white noise has so many different frequencies that there's really not the opportunity to form a standing wave. So really what we're measuring in that one is this kinetic sound pressure effect. However, if we play a pure tone, let's say 3.2 kilohertz, inside that chamber there will be a standing wave where at certain places their pressure will be higher than at other places. And due to the speaker arrangement where it's four speakers and four rotor vanes, 
the rotor always runs away from the speakers because there's just more sound pressure above them, or there's a, there's a standing wave that has a high pressure area there. And so by turning the sine wave on and off, basically you can kick the rotor forwards and then turn it off as it passes over this high pressure area and then turn it on again, pushing it to the next one. So it's a little bit of a trick. I mean, it's not really a continuous rotation due to continuous sound. I'm turning it on and off, but it's still pretty cool that you can manipulate it any way you want by knowing that it does this. And it does show that acoustic streaming or this standing wave effect, I think those are even separate, standing wave and or acoustic streaming is separate from this kinetic effect where uh, the sound is actually delivering, you know, momentum to the veins. So far, I've tested carbon dioxide, sulfur, hexafluoride, and hydrogen as replacement gases in there, but I haven't tested helium yet. So let's try this one together. Um, we're gonna start by turning on the vacuum pump. And this gauge reads a little strange. It's the number of kPa below atmospheric. So when this reads negative 100, it's almost completely evacuated in there. Okay, 99.6, close enough. Oh, it's got a valve here too, so that the pump is isolated from the chamber. Then we're gonna turn on the tank valve and slowly add this to the chamber through this metering valve. Now we actually don't care about the exact rate that it fills. Um, it's just nice not to have it um, fill too uncontrolled. Like this is a nice slow fill. Forgot to turn the valve on. There we go. By the way, this balloon time tank was made back in the days when they used to give you pure helium or pretty close to it. These days, if you buy one of these balloon tanks, it typically is 80% helium and 20% air. Um, I think to prevent people from suffocating if they inhale it from balloons or something like that. But anyway, I'm pretty sure this one is probably 95% plus. Okay, so we're at uh, 0.4 kPa below atmospheric. So it's pretty much a one atmosphere of helium in there. So let's turn the sound on and see what happens. Okay, so we're currently doing 12 watts per channel, so 24 watts total going into those speakers, and I can't see any movement whatsoever. Um, it's not really doing the acoustic streaming version or the momentum transfer version of its movement. So it turns out that helium and hydrogen produce no rotation at all at 20 watts of total input power to the chamber. Air is the best performer, and sulfur hexafluoride and carbon dioxide are about 20% slower in rotation. Now, it does seem a little strange that air just happens to be the best performer. I mean, of all these gases with completely different properties, densities and acoustic impedances, why is it that air is the best? And here's what I think is happening. These speakers are actually engineered to work best in air. So how this works is there's a little diaphragm in here. This one has an annular shaped diaphragm connected to the coil. And in here, there's a strong magnetic field. And so when this is put together, it, you know, it wiggles the diaphragm. The trick is that there's just not much air in contact with this diaphragm. And so if we were to just build the speaker like this, it would be horribly inefficient because there's a lot of force behind this diaphragm, but it's just not in contact with much air. And we can't make it bigger because then we wouldn't be able to vibrate it quickly enough. If we want to do kilohertz vibrations, it has to be pretty small. So the solution is to build an acoustic transformer, a horn. And what this does, even though it looks kind of silly, it's actually performing a very critical function. You can see that there's an annular gap at the bottom there that's very small. It's really just about one or two millimeters wide around the periphery. And then at the top of this speaker, you know, the horn is very large. And so it's coupling a huge amount of air cross section to that very small diaphragm. And the shape of this thing is engineered to get the best coupling with air. So you could design a speaker that has great coupling in hydrogen or helium, but it would look different. The shape of the horn would be different and it would provide a better match, a better impedance match from that gas to the diaphragm. I think it's likely that there are other gas properties, probably the most likely one being its gamma coefficient or the, how squishy the gas is basically. The idea here is if you compress a gas, that energy can go into raising its temperature or it can go into other molecular uh, movements that don't contribute to a temperature rise. And yeah, some gases have different gamma values, but I think that effect is very small compared to this problem of acoustic matching from the speaker to the gas. What about the effect of pressure? Yeah, so measuring the speed of the rotor at different pressures is difficult because at low pressures, especially near vacuum, the thing spins forever on that sapphire bearing in there. 
So instead I decided to do a static test where I would turn the power up gradually until I just saw the rotor starting to spin and then recorded that power value. And I realized this is not quite the same because the spinning rotor takes into account pushing the air out of the way. And so we're really measuring something different here, but it does describe what's going on. You're getting more force the denser the air is, at least up to one atmosphere. The way this chamber is built, I can't go higher than an atmosphere because it would blow the lids off. But going lower than atmosphere, the curve looks pretty believable, where when you get into super low pressures, uh, the system becomes very inefficient. And for the same power, you just get a lot less torque on the rotor. So that part makes sense. And uh, obviously I couldn't test this with helium or hydrogen because it doesn't spin the rotor at all. I did test it with SF6 and got uh, a similar curve. So I have a feeling that the effective pressure is not, um, not so complicated. That one's a little bit more straightforward. So anyway, please put questions and suggestions in the comments for things you might want to test with this or anything else. And I uh, hope you found that interesting, and I will see you next time. Bye.